Well, I've now come here to Old City Cemetery in Sacramento, a place that is home to the great and the good of Sacramento who are now resting here. It's also important because it's the only place in the city where you can find a plaque to the great cholera epidemic that devastated the city in 1850. In the early 1840s, California was sparsely populated by American and European settlers. However, after gold was discovered in the foothills just northeast of Sacramento in 1849, hundreds of thousands of people rushed to the state to find their fortune. Thus, the population began to boom and settlements like Sacramento and San Francisco grew exponentially. But as ever, with a rapidly growing population, the dangers of life in the West multiplied, with increases in crime, filth and most seriously, disease. During and after the California Gold Rush, ships brought travellers to the west coast either via arduous, months-long journeys around Cape Horn or via much shorter sea routes that navigated through the Panama Isthmus. Others arrived on foot, hauling themselves and whatever possessions they brought across the wide continent of North America. Many arrived in San Francisco before hopping aboard tightly packed steamships bound for Sacramento. The wooden sailing ships, the steamers and the wagon trains were the perfect environments for spreading infection far and wide across the country. At some time in October 1850, the deadly and terrifying cholera disease arrived to wreak havoc in the city. According to some contemporary accounts, cholera was brought to Sacramento by a passenger on board the steamship The New World, a man who died very shortly after arriving. Others date it as arriving sometime later. Either way, it was the sea and land emigration that dragged the disease with it. Societies in the 19th century dealt with an array of lethal diseases such as smallpox, typhoid, diphtheria and tuberculosis, but cholera was particularly frightening for people in the 1850s. It was not just a relatively new disease, it also had a disturbing symptoms such as unbearable intestinal cramps, vomiting and uncontrollable diarrhoea. It thrives in filthy conditions and is spread through human waste that gets into water systems. A bulging frontier city like Sacramento was the perfect breeding ground. Once infected, cholera can kill an otherwise healthy person within hours. As one eyewitness during the Sacramento outbreak reported, a man walking down J Street last evening dropped suddenly and lived only long enough to be carried to the nearest door. Cases in the city rose dramatically. Hundreds of people were infected within weeks and in one week alone, 188 people were reportedly killed by cholera. After under a month, 800 to 1,000 people were dead and so many fled the city that the population dropped by some 80%. It must have started to look like a ghost town. In the new Helvetia Cemetery, mass graves were dug to deal with the amount of bodies. After flooding, some years later, the bodies were removed to City Cemetery where they were unceremoniously reinterred. They are thought to lie today beneath a plot of military graves in the city cemetery. During the epidemic, 17 of the city's 40 or 50 physicians were killed. Many of these men, such as Dr. Thomas Logan, had given their lives whilst tending to the sick. The memorial in Old City Cemetery was created to remember their names and honor their contribution. Hardin Bigelow, the mayor responsible for the levy system and who we will meet again, was another high-profile victim of the disease, dying of cholera whilst in San Francisco. City officials also attempted to control the outbreak despite no knowledge of how it was spread. They ordered citizens to burn garbage in the streets in an attempt to rid the city of the bad air that was thought to carry infection. Instead, this only made matters worse as people burned piles of garbage animal carcasses and rotted meat in the streets, further filling the air with a fetid stench and adding to the bacteria that leached into the waterways. In the end, the epidemic passed, but cholera made intermittent reappearances throughout Sacramento County. Between 1850 and 1900, 588 people were killed. Doctors in the mid-1800s pleaded with city officials to create a board of health to oversee control of infectious disease, but it was repeatedly denied as it was thought that cholera was no longer a major threat and it would be too much of a burden on the taxpayer. Another consequence of the massive flood of people, mostly single men, into California during the 1849 gold rush was a demand for land and housing. In Sacramento, most of the land was owned by John Sutter and eventually his son, John Sutter Jr. In fact, around 40 million acres of land in California was owned by only 800 people. 
Some of the vast amounts of lands held by the Sutters were leased or sold to land speculators. Thus, when eager young men arrived in the area to make their fortunes, they found that the speculators who monopolised the land were charging extortionate rates. With few other options, many of these newly arrived men set up cabins on already claimed land around the city and near to Sutter's Fort. Then, in October 1849, a logger named Z.M. Chapman had a lawsuit filed against him for constructing a log cabin on land owned by a private company. Swiftly, another squatter, physician Charles L. Robinson, agreed with Chapman and built his own shack nearby. Both men directly challenging the claims of Sutter and his monopolising associates. After more men arrived and set up home in the claimed land around Sacramento, they established Law and Order Association, along with an unofficial armed militia to challenge the price hiking speculators. With tensions already running high between the squatters and Sutter and the city council, they boiled over into active unrest when one squatter, John T. Madden, was convicted of unlawful occupation by Sacramento Judge Edward Phillips. Squatters printed handbills criticising the city officials and spread them around the city to increase support for their cause. Charles L. Robinson then allied with newspaper editor James McClatchy and a publication was produced called The Settlers and Miners Tribune that openly attacked the landowners' practices. On August 13, 1850, McClatchy, now widely being seen as a champion of the people, was jailed on board the prison ship LaGrange after resisting the city sheriff. The next day, Robinson rallied a group of 40 to 50 armed men and marched on downtown Sacramento with one intention being to free McClatchy. Fearing a major uprising, the Mayor Hardin Bigelow, yes, him again, raised a militia of settlers and marched out to face them. The two armed groups eventually met where I am standing now, at the corner of 4th and J Street. Amidst the shouting, shots were fired and both Mayor Bigelow and squatter leader Robinson were shot. In the skirmish, five people were killed, including the city assessor, Jay Woodland, and two bystanders. The city council soon mustered 500 militiamen and declared martial law. A group of these militiamen marched a few miles out of the city centre to squatters based in a Sacramento settlement called Brighton. There, three more squatters were shot dead by the militia. Eventually, the situation was controlled. James McClatchy was released from LaGrange two days later, whilst Mayor Bigelow went to San Francisco to recover from his wounds, where he promptly died of cholera. The squatters' de facto leader, Charles L. Robinson, was jailed, but his popularity remained high. His name was added to a ballot by his supporters and he was elected to the California State Legislature while still in prison. He would eventually go on to become the first governor of Kansas, as well as the first governor of Kansas to be impeached. The squatter riots may have ended in bloody suppression by the city council authorities, but the extortion practices were slowly ended by Sacramento's land speculators, despite the surviving squatters ultimately losing the legal battle. On the night of November the 2nd, 1852, a fire broke out in a hat-making store on J Street. The store was part of the finely built and upmarket Overton block, a residential and commercial block tightly packed with wooden buildings. What's worse, as the newspaper the Sacramento Daily Union reported, many of the buildings were lined with cheap cotton textiles instead of plaster. Thus, they stood no chance in an inferno, and all it took was one careless match or a candle flame to ignite a disastrous blaze. Within hours, the flames had spread from the millinery store to subsume the entire block. Soon, it was completely destroyed, with tens of thousands of dollars of merchandise destroyed. But the fire didn't stop at one block. The flames leapt from street to street, easily igniting the dry wooden buildings of downtown Sacramento. The flames roared, the timber crackled, and contemporary scenes even depict explosions of stored goods flinging debris high into the air. When it eventually burned itself out, some 85% of the city was destroyed with thousands of people left without shelter, food or clothing. Many business owners were financially ruined with all of their stock lost and creditors still demanding their loans be repaid. An estimated six million in damage was done by the fire, tens of millions in today's money. However, soon the plucky citizens returned. Stores were established in the middle of the street between the piles of burnt timbers. And within a month, over 750 new buildings were constructed testament to the resilience and tenacity of the early Californian settlers. The Daily Union remarked on the importance of Sacramento and the rebuilding efforts. Strike from the map, the city of Sacramento and civilization on the Pacific will lose one of its brightest jewels. One of the only buildings to survive the blaze was the Lady Adams. Built by German immigrants as a wholesale and import warehouse, it still stands today in the heart of Old Town, one of the city's bustling tourist hotspots. Sacramento lies in a wide and shallow valley beneath the massive Sierra Nevada mountain range. 
The city also has two rivers running through, the American River and the Sacramento River. Sacramento therefore has all of the ingredients necessary for great floods, with ice and snow thawing on the distant mountains and sending water coursing into the two rivers, whose wide banks can only contain so much. Furthermore, like much of the rest of the state of California, the regions around the city are highly prone to wildfire. For Sacramento citizens in the 1800s, floods and fires were common. However, nothing could have prepared them for the immense deluge that submerged the city in the winter and spring of 1862. On the 8th of November 1862, rain began to fall. This rain would not stop for at least another 30 days, and in some places longer. According to reports, some nine inches fell in just 36 hours. Sacramento had experienced extensive flooding in the 1850s, but spearheaded by the efforts of the future mayor Hardin Bigelow, a levee system was built to protect the city that was fast growing into a California trade hub. Tragically, the very structure designed to protect the fledgling city ended up being the cause of the unprecedented damage that the city suffered that year. As water broke through in one place on the protective levee, the rest of the defences stayed strong. So as the flood water continued to flow in unchecked, the other levees simply acted to hold it in. With nowhere to go, the flood level rose and rose within the city. In places, it was said to be 10 feet deep. Newspapers reported that entire wooden houses were carried off by the floodwaters, some even with the inhabitants still inside. According to the Sacramento Daily Union, a settlement of Chinese immigrants north of the city was entirely washed away with 45 people lost to the floodwater. The rain continued from November until January, but the floodwaters themselves lasted in Sacramento for months until well into the spring. In fact, the state government was forced to relocate to San Francisco in order to keep functioning. Eventually, a work gang cut into the levee and finally the floodwaters broke free and began to flow back away from the city. According to a report by the New York Times, the floods inundated towns, swept away mills, dams, flumes, houses, fences, domestic animals, ruined fields and affected damage estimated at $10 million. Houses were full of sticky mud that was hard to remove, the railroad was badly damaged and the stinking corpses of farm animals littered the streets. Many citizens of the city were without clothes or food, and city officials were deeply concerned on how funds could ever be raised to support those who had lost everything. In the end, taxes were raised to fund new city initiatives, and the streets of Sacramento themselves were raised in a massive construction project in the 1860s. The threat of flood remains even to this day, however, and meteorologists warn that another great flood could be due for Sacramento at any time. The storm of 1986 was one of the costliest in the history of Northern California. It raged from February the 11th to February the 20th and consisted of three separate storms that battered the state with increasing intensity. In the end, the storm took 13 lives and caused damage totaling $400 million with record-breaking rainfall and widespread flooding. The storm itself was caused by a weather system known as an atmospheric river or Pineapple Express, whereby low pressure systems push up from Hawaii and across the Pacific, bringing wind and rain. At the time, the state of California had only one weather radar, so reactions were not as quick as we might expect today. However, meteorologists tracked the storm continuously and emergency services worked flat out to coordinate relief and rescue efforts. The first storm hit Northern California on February the 11th, but consisted of lighter rainfall that was not above expected levels for that time of year. The second storm front hit from February the 14th to the 16th, with harder rainfall and stronger winds hitting the city. Streams and rivers in the surrounding region began to fill, if not to burst, and both the Sacramento and American rivers began to flow faster through the city. From February the 17th to the 20th, the third storm struck, this time with more ferocity than the first two. Sacramento had five inches of rainfall in around three days, whilst Blue Canyon, a small town in Placer County to the north of Sacramento, experienced 18 and a half inches of rain. On the 18th of February, a coffer dam broke on the unfinished Auburn Dam, and 180,000 acre feet of water was released, cascading downstream and into Folsom Lake, around 25 miles north of Sacramento. The lake began to rise, and there were grave concerns about its ability to cope with such a large inflow of water. 
Eventually, Folsom Lake was pushed over its designated capacity, the first time this has ever happened in its history. But the waters were thankfully contained. With the American and Sacramento rivers bulging, Discovery Park in downtown and Sacramento was eventually submerged under floodwaters, with the river rising to just beneath the city's famous Tower Bridge behind me. However, the defensive levees held strong and Sacramento was spared the terrible damage experienced elsewhere. 40 miles away in the town of Linda, everything was all but completely submerged under floodwaters when the Feather River broke through levees and spilled 30 miles of floodwater that reached 10 feet in some places and forced a massive evacuation. There, some 3,000 homes were badly damaged with 895 almost completely destroyed. The residents of Linda eventually filed a lawsuit against the state of California, which was finally settled in 2004, with the state being held responsible for millions of dollars in damages. Back in Sacramento, farmland was damaged and both the I-5 and Highway 99 roadways were closed thanks to massive flooding, mudslides and rockfall. Perhaps scariest of all is that these weather systems are recurring and the US Geological Survey warns residents of California that such storms will happen again it's just a matter of when. Well, that has been the top five historical disasters to strike Sacramento, from floods to fires to raging epidemics. I guess if one theme is constant throughout all of this, however, it's that the citizens have shown time and again their ability to withstand what life throws at them and to revive their city each time bigger and better than it was before. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing and feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching.